I have here with me uh, the head coach of Malaysia's International Mathematical Olympiad team, Mr. Ivan Chan Kai Chin. Thank you for having me. Okay, well, all right, cool. We have a lot to talk about, like, uh, you know, like in terms of like discussing math, you know, your role essentially in coaching like the Malaysian team and stuff of that nature right there. But maybe, I guess, could you begin by maybe introducing yourself a little bit? Um, <clears throat> sure. Uh, my name is Ivan, and mm. I'm born in Malaysia, Penang. Oh, Penang? And... Yes, correct. Oh, wow. Oh, gosh. So many smart kids from Penang. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry for the interruption. Okay, well, I mean, three IMO, med- three IMO gold medalists are from Penang, so I think that counts. <laughs> Three <laughs> IMO gold medalists are from Penang. I, I think that's like what Jaron, and then like I think that's like is it the song and Enzo, and Enzo. Oh gosh, oh, is it something in the water? Is that something that's going on right there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, jokes aside, though. Well, I just actually interviewed a couple of very very smart Penang kids for well pathways to excellence, which of course like you're on at the moment. And uh, yeah, so that would definitely be something to well talk a little bit more about. But anyway, so just for our audience uh, right here, so Mr. Chan essentially, well, is an ex-Olympian. And then of course, like, you know, you have the, this whole little uh, IMO website right here. And for those of you, by the way, who are not too familiar at the moment, so the IMO, the International Mathematical Olympiad, is quite possibly... Well, actually, maybe I shouldn't even say, like, quite possibly, because, like, you know, Mr. Head Coach is right here. He's going to crucify me later. It is <laughs> no. the, the <clears throat> most prestigious competition for students throughout the course of the world. Any student out there who has wished to spread their wings and to soar upon the currents of ambition to seek mathematical mastery will have heard of the IMO. And incredibly prestigious competition. How many countries participate in the IMO coach? I think it's about 110 this year. 110? Oh, roughly okay. number. Roughly that number, yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And all you need to be is less than 20 years old and you're still enrolling a high school or middle school or primary school. It doesn't matter, but less than 20 years old and you're not enrolling in a university, then you're eligible to participate. Wow. Okay, okay, okay. Cool, 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 cool. So maybe coach, I guess like, can you tell us a little bit about, well, how you, well, took up this current role that you have as essentially like uh, the head coach of the, I guess like IMO Malaysia team and maybe also talk a little bit about the history of like the International Mathematical Olympiad in Malaysia. Because there is a chance that essentially like a lot of people from Malaysia aren't even aware that this is a thing. Okay, so maybe I should talk a little bit about the history. Mm-hmm. Um, so first of all, I think you can just call me Ivan. I don't think I still deserve the coach to name yet. Because okay. here's the thing. When I was still a student, it was basically run by Mr. Swami, who has been the coach for, I think, since 2006 to 2019. 13 years of that I don't think I have that yet. Mm. So if you want, I think he's the real coach and laying down the backbones for the whole training for many years already. And he just recently had his family. And so he kind of delegated more tasks throughout the time and then eventually uh, stepped down as the head coach. Mm. And then that's around 2019. And then 2020, the pandemic arrived. And there wasn't any physical BIMO classes at the time, which is the IMO training camps. And so there was this moment where the students are at loss because the IMO is near. It's in September at that time. And it was in June that they had no trainings at all, no preparations for the IMO at all. Mm -hmm. So one of the students actually asked me if I could maybe give them some exercises or advice on how to prepare. And I just thought, well, okay, I will just run some sort of an online training for them. It was only for three months and I only thought it would, it would be just a one, 
time thing because I suppose that afterwards the camps would be online again and I would not be able to teach even if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But as things turns out, there is also at the same time a change of organizational things and uh, Mr. Swami is no longer head coach. Many things have changed. The sponsorship was removed or something and there is a huge need of funds for the IMO Malaysia. And so there is a new IMO committee that is being set up running the IMONs, uh, IMO NST and so on. And that's why you see that web page over there where you have the information of the alumni. Exactly this one, yes. Mm -hmm. It was only developed in 2020. I see. And so the camps are still going to be online and they basically emailed me. No, is it? I think they just texted me asking if I'm interested to teach. And I said, of course, yes, because everything is online and even though I'm away, I can still help. Mm -hmm. uh, so that lasted for two years or three years actually. Um, and then in 2022, so at the time, Mr. Shafiq, who is another ex IMO Olympian, Mr. Shafiq was uh, is SH Shafiq. Yes, exactly. So Mr. Shafiq was the IMO team leader for 2018, 19, 2021, and 22. So five years. Mm -hmm. I see. So again, he decided to step down in 2022. Mm. Uh, so there were also a few other trainers as well. Uh, mm. Mr. Lokjigin, Mr. Zafri, Mr. Shafi, and so on. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, there are some IMO, ex IMO Olympians, which are some of them are my friends or seniors. Mm. But then in 2023, because Mr. Shafiq have stepped down, there's mm. really no one else running the camps. I see. And yeah, even, where... even Mr. is also having his family, and so everyone is busy. Mr. Shafi as well. I see. So there's no one to teach the camps, and that's why I have to step up. I see. That. Wow. So basically, you became the head coach, like, I wouldn't say like almost like against your will, because like it was something no, it's that not. Definitely, it's definitely not it against is. your will, but rather it was like something that you're supposed really to do. Full, it's, fully. it's not like imposed, it's kind of like by the turn of events, step by step, I took up this pose. You took up the pose, I see, as the... Yeah, it's really kind of like... Uh, unexpectedly and definitely not planned but uh, yeah by the time of okay, course, wow. it just happened like that i feel that that is how like many of the good things in life happen just as a series of fortunate accidents that just play out in a sequence that is like maybe not necessarily random because like you know you can like you know change the order of things i guess <laughs> You know, like if you hadn't gotten, I guess, an IMO medal, or if you hadn't been involved in this process at all, then maybe the circumstances would not have been there. So maybe, you know, it wasn't entirely a random thing, but rather somehow there was a series of events maybe that uh, led you, I guess, to where you are. So then... Yeah, and enjoy maybe, teaching students as well. This is oh fun. yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. You didn't want me to call you uh, coach, right? So then I'll just say Ivan then. So Ivan, could yeah. you maybe share no. a little bit? Well, <laughs> well, all right. Your journey in mathematics um, so far, like, well, what led us here? Can you maybe start from the start? And can you tell us a little bit about your early interest in math and what sparked your interest in the subject? I don't think I remember because... Uh, as far as I could remember, I think numbers are more interesting than letters. Numbers? I could not. Mm. Yeah, I could count, but I could not read at the time. Wow. I remember reading, speaking was way more difficult. Like, I could not speak when I was age three, I think. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But then by then, I think I could add or count already. I think. Wow. Or maybe I, maybe I don't know. I forgot. I don't remember. 
But then, from a very young age, I remember there was some special affinity to numbers already. So, for example, I still remember my dad's first car's name. Uh, the, not the letters, but the numbers. I'm oh, sorry, not the letters of the car plate, but the numbers instead. Or like, if I go to someone's house, I remember what's the door number and so on. So, yeah, or even the postcodes or something. Numbers has always interested me. Wow. Even since then. Amazing. Okay. And then, uh, mm -hmm. then you find the multiplication table, which is boring because it's just memorizing numbers. I did not like that. Uh, right. But then there are more things that interest me. Like right. I remember something to do with creators' common devices or something because I kept you... seeing some numbers that appears in the multiplication table many times. I see. And then I, asked, I think I asked my dad, why are these numbers there always? I see. That's well, the first time I was exposed to LCM. And yeah, from there, I was very... going to ask um, a question that was kind of related to that. Because like having an affinity to numbers, well, doesn't necessarily mean that you would become good, for example, at, well, using them, right? Or perhaps, well operating with them, like finding relationships yeah, between them, stuff of definitely. that nature right there. So then... Even well, argue, if, I would even argue like, even if you're good at IMO or you want to go metal, doesn't mean that you'll be a good mathematician. Right. So, mm -hmm. I know that myself, the road to a mathematician is very difficult. So I agree with what you think. Like, the, the young stage of being good at math or interested in math does not translate to how you will perform when you are older, definitely. I see. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, all right. Nonetheless, though, well, for every journey still, there is a sort of beginning, right? And of course, you know, when I look at your IMO profile so that I can see that essentially, you did take this interest towards, well, studying math at Cambridge, um, where you eventually, well, completed well, the mathematical tripos and uh, essentially various things of that nature. So then I guess there was that sort of like, because like that's not something that you can do if you are just, well, fascinated by numbers, right? Like you, you could look at numbers and like you could, <laughs> yeah, like uh, just add them together or perhaps you could have been caught in like illusions of mastery. Like for example, I don't know, like being able to, well, get 100% on an at maths paper. Now, that might convince you that, oh, you know, like, I'm supremely good at math. But for some reason or another, that didn't actually happen for you, at least not at the time, for sure. Um, so maybe would you share a little bit about, I guess, like, your journey into exploring, like, those numbers that you saw as a child in, like, a little bit more depth, if you could? I think... From a very young age, you have the whole motivation of why you learn mathematics has to be correct. Mm -hmm. If you are doing it just because you are good at it and things come easy for you, then you will only go as far as to a point where you find it difficult. And that's it. And that's it. Mm -hmm. I think many... How should I put it? There are many students who do math because math was easy for them. And of course, they are talented in it, no doubts. Mm -hmm. But there are only very few who could persevere even to PhD. That's the huge difference. Um, I think the main reason is because, as you said, they want to have a sense of uh, how should I put it? Like supreme, like a superior feeling that I am good at it. <laughs> but that would only let you that far, where you know you you have good achievements in in your life. Yes, you have gone to MIT or Cambridge. Yes, but then what's after that? Eventually, you you're gonna hit the wall and say, "Now I find it difficult." 
What's next? For sure. For one thing that I'm in bond right now, uh, this already, I, I just wanted to point this out. Like, if I'm someone who does math for the supreme feeling, I think I would have stayed in Cambridge for my masters. Uh, but then, first of all, I realized there was nothing much to learn there anymore. As in, not to say nothing much to learn, but more like I've exposed enough to what is going on over there. And then I wanted to move to another new environment to learn something new. Indeed, I've learned way more, not to say way more, but very different things in Bond as well. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I'm kind of sacrificing the prestige because I know everyone knows Cambridge, but you know, people only know the unis from US and UK. Uh, I'm sacrificing that prestige for the sake of learning more math. That is so I, that is very because like that is the, many, really not many people would appreciate. Not many people would do that. Um, so if you know, for example, that MIT is not offering you the subject that you really really want to learn, would you still go there for the sake of prestige? So I think a lot of the math students currently, especially if their motivation is to go to a good uni, I think they would still pick the good unis. But then I know for me, I wouldn't. But that's just, I mean like, it can be good like in a different way, right? Cause like when we talk about like say, prestige good and also, well, quality of education, good right there i think that those they things correlate things. i guess sorry they do correlate they do correlate but they correlate they but like not there, there's no like mm. directly correlated. got it okay okay mm, all right so then i guess like what do you feel i guess has been some of your major takeaways um from being at bond so far like uh i guess I enjoy um, not having so much attention. That's for sure. <laughs> attention like what? Like, yeah, uh, Asian I feel like life is more just, like, take picture, be all like, oh my god, Cambridge student, Cambridge student. Uh, it's kind of like, 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 <laughs> exactly, that's, that's how I felt. I did not like it at all. I did not like it at all. Yes. I see. And now I feel like life is a lot more low key. A lot more free. Low key. Okay. Low -key I can really okay. not have this burden of being a chemistry student means I have to do well, blah, blah, blah. No. I see. I can just <laughs> take the time to learn the math. That is so refreshing because like, I feel that a lot of people, you know, I, I actually came across this uh, in an interview with, uh, you know, another student who actually chose Yale over Cambridge. Basically what he said, like towards the end of the interview was like, do you know what you really want? Just because you believe that you want it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you actually do want it. Chances are, it is not what you actually want. Um, and maybe like essentially butchering what he said right there. But so basically, prestige is not necessarily like the be all and all. And there may be more enriching things ahead that a person should always consider along the way. All right then. Can I can I point out something that you have mentioned? Sure, go ahead. You may not know if that's what you want, even though you think you want it. Is that mm -hmm. what he said? Uh, to add on to that, uh, not just to say doing math, but many other things as well. Especially when the reward is not as obvious or not immediate. You have to have this ability to stick towards it and in other words you must have a very strong resolve why you want to do it in the first place because there will be times where you don't actually want to do it for example even math i see imo is just five years let's say mm -hmm. five years or ten years or some a math research career is for a lifetime there mm -hmm. will be times where you don't want to do it at all Maybe even for years you don't want to do it. Was it how you how would you be able to stick to it and still say it would be worth it in the end of the day? 
that is the key uh, really a test of your mental strength i think i see wow i mean and this is why you need to logically think carefully what are the reasons why you want to pick this and not just based on feelings you have to be sure what are the logical reasons that you chose this path in the first place mm. for me it's really clear. i do not enjoy doing languages uh, arts i don't not to say arts as in uh, visual arts what i mean it's like political sciences or like economics i do not enjoy it and then also i do not want to work for companies because my efforts would be basically washed away by a big name of a company like for example publishing papers for the company but you know you're just one member of the team and i see you know, so if you really have to how should i put it if you want to have this sense of personal achievement that you're working for yourself mm. there are many ways for it of course you can also have your business you can have uh, many other things but for me i think what fits me the most after thinking through many other alternatives really in the end is still research mm. and this is why even when the times come that i don't feel motivated i don't feel like doing it i think that i don't actually want it mm. no, sorry, i feel that i don't actually want it i can think back i know actually it is still the best move right almost so as that's if the you're key. kind of like reverting back to like your nature um or maybe i don't know like you would call it like nature because like research perhaps is something that <clears throat> is difficult to do i guess but more of like the equilibrium towards which your heart would settle when you consider the set of possible alternatives or, or, or options that uh happen to be in yeah. front of you would yeah. I, would I basically like my thing? advice is for students is to really think through your choices not just what you feel like you want one thing something you know that feeling can change many a, a lot of times you can actually change because that's what you feel mm. but you really have to think carefully and stick to it after that yeah just interesting mm. um, huh. you know you, you can sway away to many different distractions but if you have your heart set on one thing that is that thing that you go for i think many students do not have this quality yet or maybe just not for math i think I mm-hmm. that's what i hope that me going through this path not giving up yet i still want to do a phd at least can give some sort of a role model or motivation for students to come for sure and otherwise if i've given up then people would think that yes even though you are a trainer but there will be always that one hidden question why didn't you become a mathematician then i see okay you know it's interesting because you seem to be sharing about a desire that is both uncommon and also deep-seated like the re- career of a mathematician i oh, imagine I that i think it's very common i think it's very common just put in context about marriage i think that is very clear <laughs> okay yeah. right? you, you only get one choice you think that that's the best one you married it and that's it there will be times that are difficult and you don't want to but that's what you have chosen you have to stick to it you have you have become married to math got it <laughs> all right yeah pretty much so yes i see i mean it's it's the same for any kind of dedication if you want to really excel in something that's how you have to take it if you change your hobbies or you change your goals every few years that is fine i mean most people are like that but you get to explore many things i get that but you won't be able to achieve much for each of the things that you have tried i see understood got it got it yeah okay so in that light then like even i don't know like how do you view while formulating that problem number three uh for the imo well like was it 
like how did you feel like in that moment because like of course like you did mention like a very long journey right and perhaps um even the process of like you know like formulating that particular problem was just like one of um the things that essentially happened along the way but then uh-huh. how do you view something like this right here and maybe would you share i guess a little bit about the thought process that was going through your mind when you formulated this actually i can be very honest it took me a few hours to create this problem in <laughs> fact it was i mean last okay so there was a deadline for prom submissions i think it's april 23rd or something yeah, yeah i remember i created it as the very last question before the submission so after that i had no other creation and i just submitted everything to okay okay right so it was really a last minute effort but turns out to be the best one but it was unexpected <laughs> uh, good things come in although i do right. need to say the 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 struggles behind it or before it those are huge i do agree but for this particular problem itself it actually took me just half half a day or one day to formulate and solve it so maybe it is not as great as people would want to imagine uh, but mm-hmm. uh, the thought process i've wrote it and published it in aops basically it started with the team selection test and that we need some problems for it and then there were some suggestions on what the problem could be and I took one of those suggestions and I modified it. it. Took me like a few hours to modify it. And then I realized it could be very nice and I should not waste it for the team selection test. And so <laughs> I stopped it and then Yeah, that's how this problem came up. And that's how this problem came about. Incredible. Okay. Yeah. So I mean how did it feel when like do you remember the exact moment when you discovered that this problem was selected remember, for the IMO? I remember. I remember. Can you, can you share like what it is that as, was like? It is as good as when I first knew that I got into Cambridge. <laughs> How do you uh, compare these two then? Are they comparable events? Like if you were to like try to rank order? In terms of, in terms of happiness and excitement, both are almost equal. I would say actually equal. But then if you talk about the heaviness or the, the consequence of the event, this one is trivial, I think. I because you, know, you got the problem in the IMO, yes. But then it's, that's about you, it. you become a part of history. I mean, like that's for sure. You know, like uh, how many other people like around the world, Cambridge undergraduates included, um, you know, like got a uh, problem in the IMO. I mean, like, yeah, but in terms people. of the consequence, it is not so much. Whereas yes. the other one, okay. where I got into Cambridge, it was life changing, really life changing. Really life changing. Imagine if I did not get into that, I might just study in NUS or maybe in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. I would not have any of these opportunities right now. So that one thing is really life changing. And well, this one, that case, um, it feels like winning a lottery instead. <laughs> for sure, yeah. Would you share a bit about how? Very heavy, but yeah. Sorry. Well, would you share a bit about how well Cambridge changed your life then, if uh, you could? Oh, I mean, it changed basically everything. Everything. Uh, I have to be independent, live by myself, and uh, being able to adapt to a new country, um, mm. being open to many new cultures and friends. I have many friends from abroad. And it's just completely life changing. The the amount of math that I could learn is beyond my imaginations at the time. Beyond your imagination at the time. It's so beyond my imagination at the time. There were not just math. There are also phys- theoretical physics that I also very like, very much liked it, and I just do not know where to start. Yeah. It's like, I know special relativity, I know quantum physics, but what are they? I never had these questions. I, I, I never have these answers. And only after I got to Cambridge, then I get to see how the lectures are like. 
and it changed my life forever. Incredible. Okay. Then same as Bond as well, where now I learn about uh, algorithms and optimizations. Again, those are life changing as well. I would not have got these if I did not move the Bond. Wow. I find it very impressive that like the learning uh, is worth much more uh, at the very least from what I can see from like the like the limited information I know about your decision right there like the learning seems to have been by far more the driving factor so I respect you for that like uh, definitely I think that's so then, what all right. hope the student will appreciate and take up as well for sure yeah and not because, because of university application not just because of like <laughs> external like factors I guess like even a lot of people are not even really at the stage of like thinking about that just yet like they may they might be thinking in the very first place like oh you know like i don't even know um that this sort of like opportunity is even out there they may not even know about cambridge they may not even know about um yeah know, like, uh, i did not know that as well you don't know that as well yeah. no, no, but it's okay i mean like whoever just randomly sees this video will know uh for sure well all right in Maybe fact, then... just apply to cambridge because i thought oh i get to learn more math there that's all that there are many good mathematicians there that's all I did not even know that prestigious uni. I'm telling you. You did not know. My, I mean, my parents know that. My parents know that. Maybe many others know that. My friends know that. I was too much into math world that I actually did not know about that. I know it's perfectly. I know it's good, but I don't actually know how prestigious it actually is. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Right. But then that was me back then. Uh, it was purely a math nerd if you put it you can put it that way <laughs> i can imagine yeah well but then now, like many students are doing it for university applications they kind of see far ahead what is already there for them and it kind of kills the motivation or kills the correct motivation for them to learn mathematics whereas for me while well, still in malaysia i haven't got to uni yet Actually, I can tell you my life was very happy because I had no stress. I was just learning math all I wanted to. And that's all. I mean, now it's not to say I'm stressed, but more like there are more responsibilities. There are more planning that I have to do. And you definitely have to be careful. Back then, it was really careless. It's just math all day. Math all day. <laughs> uh, it is it's wow. true. It's true. And, and you basically it's true. like... like treat it as a form of leisure well i think a lot of people like they would have this sort of like you know like this resistance to the idea of like you know making it really such a part of uh, their lives as i don't well. think it's more like a i don't think it's kind of like uh leisure it's more like doing school homework is out of my world and then playing piano i like it so that i can get to see what other things are like and then I retreat back to math world again. <laughs> so it's like almost almost sleeping while thinking of problems in the dreams as well. So Wow. Yeah. Like kinda that, that was me. I mean now now I'm living in, in Earth. Back then I wasn't in Earth. So You were okay, I see. Wow. Yeah, wow. back then another, I wasn't on another planet altogether. So, another dimension. Yeah, so the the whole thought of leisure from uh, doing math for leisure just doesn't seem right. Because it wasn't, it wasn't even leisure. Not exactly like leisure, it's more of like an instinct. It was just kind of like... Um, instinct, yeah. yes. Kind of. Instinct, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Okay. So I'd like to transition, if possible, now to a discussion about your coaching experience. But of yeah. course, like, to even discuss the coaching experience in the first place, so maybe, like, can you share a little bit about how you even got uh, to the IMO, like your personal journey uh towards that because like again, again as i told you uh i wasn't living on earth so uh, i wasn't really living on earth so really at the time uh i did not think about making to imo i did not think about achievements like, or any medal you remember or which primary school you were at and um like i guess like the kinds of events that eventually let you um yeah, so maybe you can share a bit about your academic background, like, and then eventually how you ended up 
maybe through like primary school, secondary school, high school, eventually going to like the. Oh, okay. Uh, I think first of all, my dad taught me a lot of math when I was young. When you were young, uh, basically single-handedly taught me up to eight math, I think, and then even from six math as well. Single-handedly. Wow. Is he a mathematician as well, or engineer? Engineer. But okay. He's very good at math and physics. Okay. As well. Got it. Mm -hmm. uh, because of him, I got interested in both subjects. That's one. And definitely have a good head start in terms of exposure. Mm. Then in primary five or six, uh, yeah, I, when I use the word then, it's really these then. Uh, in primary six, I participated in a primary Olympiad math competition. I forgot what's the name, I think it's APMOPS or something. Mm. And I got past the first round, the national round, and then into the second round in Singapore, I remember. Mm. Uh, there, I did not do well. It's fine. I, it, it's a long time ago, in 2010. And I remember there was a bookstore that sells Olympiad books. There was two books that is made for secondary Olympiads. Those two books really interested me because I did not understand a single page of it. <laughs> so I bought them and then I took the time to read it page by page. I really got hooked by it. I think that's 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 the interesting part. I do not know anything about it. That's why I bought it. The rest, since I've already known them, then what's the point of buying it, right? That's true, yeah. Oh, I read. Right, right. And so, uh, yeah, those two books were my very first secondary Olympiad books. Do um, you remember their titles? I don't, I don't think I do. Uh, no problem. The yeah, unnamed I books. It almost sounds like something from like a martial arts movie or something. It's like the, the <laughs> character finds an unnamed book that has no identity, no provenance, nothing. But somehow or another, I could try to search it up. Don't worry. I could try to search it up. <laughs> okay, sure. All right. Uh, I moved to my secondary school in Form One, and yeah, at the time, the school did not even know about math Olympics. Nothing at all. I kind of urged the school to register me and a few more students for the OMK, which is the National Olympic. Thankfully, they did. Otherwise, I would never have made it to the BIMO. So thankfully, they did. And the first year uh, passed by and I think I wasn't selected at the time because yeah, it was just my first year. And then in my second year from two, I got selected to the selection test for the BIMO. That was the first time there's some good progress to it. And then I got past that as well and made it to the IMO camps in Form 3. So wow. that's 2013. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then good for my school because afterwards, I think my friend, my classmate as well, he also went to BIMO. Wow. In, so, it's like yeah. that phenomenon whereby like success breeds success, right? I can't exactly remember like what it is called um, anymore, but let's ask ChatGPT. Um, what do we call that phenomenon whereby the success of one person then leads into success for many other people as well? And incidentally, at this moment, I'm thinking about the example of Jaron at the moment and how perhaps uh, that may end up inspiring many other people. And there's a whole chain of inspiration that, you know, it's like taking place um, right here. I have, um, I guess, like some questions about that, but uh, that'll come a little bit later on. So somebody else um, went with you right here. And I'm guessing that you made like some friends right there, like uh, fellow math geeks like yourself. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Those... Yeah. Those were the best times for me. I can say, I can still say it's the best time for me. The best time for me. The best time the, of my life. I would say there were like 20 days of 
camps every year for uh, I think it's five days for four camps, so it's about twenty days. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Got you. I can still remember each of them like it was yesterday. Each of them like it was yesterday. Wow. There's like um. Very vivid. Um, thought process that's going on right there, I guess. And then eventually, like, you got selected for the IMO, like, training camps, and then, like, eventually competed for Malaysia. And what was that experience like? Do you remember uh, that as well? Um, then you start to feel not so much in your math world anymore, because then you have to actually go back to Earth and realize I can't do that anymore. I actually have to train for the country and you know not so much for myself actually. I, I was thinking, I mean I do want the gold medal, yes. But um I start to realize I'm actually in love and I have to train also for the country because they do want gold medals as well. Mm-hmm. And um, when I didn't make it to the gold medal. I mean, when I did not get it, I do feel upset. But still, the 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 prime motivation is still enjoying good questions and math in general. And making, uh, I remember I was how do I put it? I think I was very close to making to the team in twenty fourteen, which is my second year in the camps. Mm. Uh, narrowly, I missed the chance. It's fine. I told myself because I still have one more year for five, and I was pretty confident that I could make it to the team by then, and so I wasn't too upset about not making the team at the time. In fact, I was spending one whole year afterwards really training hard so that I prepare myself for the next IMO.、Mm. And in my first try next year, I got the bronze medal, which I'm quite happy about. Because as a first timer, what do I expect, right?、Mm. Again, that's the time, that's the era back then. I hope in future, even first timers are aiming for gold medals, but that、mm. we will keep it for future.、Uh, but either way, yeah.、Uh, obviously, when I saw the email that I really got into IMO, I was happy. Right. But、And、my parents were more happy than I do. <laughs> I think. <laughs> for me,、yeah. I've internalized this idea that I will make it to the team eventually. Mm. In twenty four, I just have to work hard for it. And, and in fact, I was also thinking that even if I do make it, that's not the end yet. The medal itself, or the result at the IMO, is the final thing、mm. that I should be looking for.、Mm. Okay, and. Just to also provide our audience with a little bit of context, so essentially, if you are selected for the IMO, then that essentially means that you're. Well, operationally speaking, one of the six top math students of the entire country is that right, Evan? Of that generation, yes. Of that particular generation. Of, few, of that few school years, yes. Like basically, of that few school years, basically,、yeah. you're one of the top six in the entirety、yes. of Malaysia, and that's like beyond question.、Um, also, like, course, that is, that is operational speak, operationally speaking because. Your sample, your sample space is from the ten thousand students who took the William K. But there are still many regions who do not know about math Olympiads at all. There might be hidden talents in those places which are not yet exposed to the IMO, and definitely, right on. I think there will be a lot more good students、right. once they are discovered. Right, it's like. How many people could have become Bill Gates but didn't actually receive the opportunity to? Or if not Bill Gates, then like, you know, like how many people could become an Ivan Chan, a Jaron Wong, a Kong Wing, or basically like any、yeah, exactly. number of people who have come. This、off. is why I would not say it's operational. I wouldn't say the top six. Just operationally speaking, yes, but、uh, in reality, I don't think so. Hmm. I see. Well, okay. Then in that case, then maybe if we could, I guess like now move to the process by which you took on a new role, like from a participant, you move on to well serving as the coach, the student who was taught before,、uh, now became the 
teacher. But of course, like that was only for I think like one year, right? It was a very recent transition. Uh, actually, the transition is very smooth, I would say, because I graduated. Yeah, I moved from uh in twenty eighteen, and then I started my uni in twenty eighteen as well. Uh, so even in twenty nineteen, I did teach one camp before. Even in twenty nineteen, I wasn't a coach at all. I was just an ex IMO student. I was teaching one of the camps, and then at the IMO twenty nineteen, I was a team guy from Malaysia. Mm-hmm. Again, I have fun giving them some random questions to try before the IMO as well. Some sort of training them, but you know, it's just for fun as a guy. Uh, and then I also enjoyed guiding them. Then in twenty twenty, uh, studies starts to get hectic, and again, I'm back to uni math again. But uh, as I told you, opportunity came just like that, and circumstances happened that. I did give them some questions to train on, and <clears throat> everything started from there. Mm-hmm. But the transition is very smooth because I remember it was just friends who are still in the team, and then it became juniors who are mm-hmm. newly coming up to the team. Juniors because they weren't in the team before, but they were in the same camp. And then later on, it's mm-hmm. uh, juniors who I've taught before. Before they went to the IMO camp, even so, basically peers, and then younger teammates, and then juniors that I've taught before, and then now students. So my role have really slowly transitioned over the years, and I think now when I when I see that everyone calls me sir, I'm like, yeah, I'm not a student anymore. <laughs> It's very, it's very gradual because back then, you know, some of them are really just my teammates, mm-hmm. and then by twenty twenty two, my last teammate Tristan have graduated as well, and then twenty twenty three, Jared Nelson, all of them are my juniors. They haven't been in the team when I was still in the camps, so technically they are still my juniors. I see. Okay. And God. then later on, one. They also graduate. The rest are really just students. So mm. I think by then there's no one who I've known them when I was still a student. So those are really just students. Wow. So the transition is actually very smooth. I would say. I see. Okay. Okay. Got it. Well, I guess. <laughs> Were you involved in some way in like the, I guess like selection process of like, you know, like choosing people or like how in fact um, does like that process of like selections go? It's like you mentioned earlier that there was like a team selection test, right? And then of course like there are multiple rounds as well. But maybe um, you can give us like some insight into this process uh, for those of us a little bit less familiar with that. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, I want one is in September. I remember, and there will be about ten thousand students taking that, taking part. I think, and, and then there will be IMONS two, where they will select maybe a few hundred students to take part in IMONS two, and then select about hundred of them for BIMO one. So BIMO one usually takes part. Uh, usually starts in November, I think. But it depends. Sometimes it's December, sometimes it's November, or sometimes even in January. Mm-hmm. But hopefully, November. And then there will be weekly camps or bi-weekly camps. So it's less intense. It's just like bi-weekly or weekly. Uh, there will be daily tests. There will be homeworks and lectures as well. And then we have BIMO two, which is maybe a little bit more intensive, but still the same group of students. Then we will select about thirty of them mm-hmm. for BIMO three, and they get to take part in APMO, which is an international contest. Mm-hmm. Then maybe about fifteen more students for BIMO four, and then for the team selection test, and then we select the team of six. When I say maybe fifteen, uh, these numbers can vary depending on the tie breaking. Because technically speaking, we just want about twelve students 
and previously about 24 students. But due to tie breaking, I don't want to make it unfair for students with very close points together. So I usually pick more of them as well. And so the buffer is from 24 to 30, and then from 12 to 15, and so on. And even at the IMO, there will be six for the team, of course, but I will usually reserve one or two spots for the squads. So there will be training for the squad members along with the team members. It's almost as if we are preparing them for the future IMOs. But IMO is different. We can't really pick eight students for the IMO, so we really have to pick the best six. But there will be also a few more spots in reserve so that we can prepare them for the future ones. Wow. So in some sense, we want to avoid the tie-breaking problem because it can be very frustrating if you are just one or, three, one or two points away and you did not get selected and had nothing afterwards. Mm. So basically, that's my motivation. Like, if you were to imagine like a sample, I guess like a space of like 10,000 students and you were to select six students out of that right there. So then correct me if I'm wrong, uh, like with my math here, um, well, I mean, in this case, you are literally like a IMO head coach at the moment, but six out of 10,000 would basically mean that of the entire pool of students right there, you would have essentially the 99.94th percentile. Like basically, uh, you can put it in that way, but mm. among the ten thousand students, are you? They are not. They are also not a normal population as well, right? Like they are not really representative. Exactly, of exactly. They are basically well. from schools where they pick the best students to participate as well. So okay. even the ten thousand students are usually among okay. the best among the schools. So like so the best among the schools. School with, okay. Yeah. So if right. for each school, maybe you multiply by. 100 or maybe 300, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe each yeah. school has three or four students participating and the school yeah. has 1,000 students. So we multiply about 300. Then really we are sampling from about 3 million students. 3 yeah. to 5 million. I see. It's not the whole country that I am aware. This is why I'm saying uh, there might be a lot more good students to come. But roughly speaking, we are sampling from a few million students. A few million yes. students to select who uh, know about the students, mm. yeah. and that is actually kind of an interesting point um, to think about. What are the factors that is integral to like the talent, uh, essentially, that can be found in a country is essentially the population. Let us say, for example, that um, like the people at the lowest level, essentially, like within, let's say, imagine if like let's say Malaysia were a huge school, for example, right. Then like, for example, then, I don't know, like what's our population right now? If like, let's say that it were 30 million, then basically then, I don't know, like 30 million people at uh, level one, 3 million people at level two, 300,000 people uh, basically at level three, then 30K, 3,000, yeah. 300, yeah. and then 30, and then basically three. Whereas if you start off with something like a billion, then like, uh, you know, you have billion, 100, 10, 1, 100k, 10k, uh, and then basically 1k, 100, and then basically 10, etc. I mean, like, by the same time, though, there are some countries that kind of, like, break this pattern. Like, for example, Singapore, which has a smaller population than us. But I guess, like, if you were to think about that right there, so then, like, do you have an opinion on, like, essentially, like, how it is that we can break that, I guess, like relationship between like population size and then talent as well. Or at least in terms of like performance in a, an international competition, like say the IMO. Or is it really meaningful to even speak of that um, in the very first place? Depends on where you want to start the discussion. Do you want to talk about the statistics or do you want to talk about the probably the way the mindset of how we are being raised uh, there are a few perspectives you can look into that if you're talking purely by statistics then uh, mm -hmm. you can look at the the 
way how the country is being run, the educational system, the the people themselves, how much are they being exposed to math, and how is the the entire society? What is the focus and what is the emphasis by the government, by the society, and so on? If you take all of these into factors, then what you really want is the filter between the levels. So you fix the level. If you achieve this standard, then in level one, this standard, you're level two, and so on. What you really want is this ratio to be smaller between the levels. So what you mentioned is one out of ten. So one to ten, you move to the next level. What you really hope for is the level to be slightly smaller. Even just by a bit, then by the time you reach the top level, there will be a lot more over there. Well, I like the transition. Oh yeah, okay. Mm, sorry. Uh, oh, the and then the second know. part obviously is the population size as well. Mm, okay, got it. Now maybe if we could speak about the particular individuals that came out of that process, maybe like uh, the top six, um, as it were. Like, I guess can you tell? Because like they are the, I guess like. Um, people who pass through that long process to eventually come towards um, where they are right here. Can you, I guess, like describe the process of, well, training these people? I guess, like, what was that like? You know, like training essentially, well, people like, well, Kong Wing, for example, or mm -hmm. Leia, for example, also. Well, you were definitely training Jaren, but he definitely mentioned that during uh, his session with uh, Jake Zafri. For sure, but well, yeah. So, like, what was it like? I guess um, training. I guess the different people in the IMO team. Like, I guess, like for this year, were they special, different, or like what was distinct about them, and how did that training process eventually well take place? Do you mean what makes them special, or how is the experience like? Instead? Let's start with, I guess, like what makes. I guess like a student special like when they are like competing at that particular level what would differentiate a person enough that they can actually get to the point of being able to do the level of math that's required for participation in the IMO I think the first thing is they must have a strong sense of rigor I think this is required in any type of math you must have a strong sense of rigor. There's no wish rationing in math. Uh, so basically, first of all, when you learn the theorem, you really have to be careful with the details. So again, those who pay attention to details, that's the first thing. Uh, because often you will see people Perifically know what it means, but then they apply it wrongly, or the situation is not valid, but they still apply it and fix off the problem. These are situations where it indicates that the student is not careful enough with details. They really have to be rigorous with what the math is telling. Uh, obviously, that also means that they have to be fluent in mathematics. That means being able to communicate your ideas with mathematical symbols. They are not just equations. Really, you are talking using mathematics. That is a key difference, I would say. Many people are doing mathematics by manipulating the equations and so on. But very few are really trying to convey their ideas or talking using mathematics, basically telling you what I'm trying to do right now. And so that comes to a very high level where your top process of solving the problem is not by doing the math, but by thinking what is the main ideas of the problem that I want to do. Then only write it down as mathematics as if you are fluent enough in that language that I'm expressing what I'm thinking using mathematics. I see. Okay. So there are different levels, I would say. I think even in any type of mathematics, really what you are acquiring, acquiring at first is the skill to, of so-called the language of the mathematics first. 
mm-hmm. then only like, it's chance for you to have ideas or thoughts about that view then only you use the fluency of the language to describe what you're thinking mm, i see okay well if i could ask then well what are some of the challenges and triumphs that you face while i guess training the imo team so far or rather like uh-huh. Yeah, what what are the challenges and triumphs that you face while I guess training the team? I mean, obviously the camps are all online, so mm. in some way it's good for me because then it's make it possible. It it makes it possible for me to train them, but obviously it is also a challenges a challenge for the students as well because yeah, everything is online, and also there were a huge need for funding for the IMO camps mm-hmm. and even for the trainers as well there is a huge need for the funding and we don't have much sponsorship other than the fees that we got from IMONs mm-hmm. so I also think that is another challenge for us financially why do you feel that that um, is the case currently though and do you see like a pathway towards well I guess like creating better kinds of like resources for our Olympiad, I guess like uh, I... Of, of training and stuff of that nature. Cause like, it is something that, you know, like even our prime minister has like celebrated, right? I think that like Anwar Ibrahim recently also did mention uh, on Twitter, if I'm not wrong, that yes, well, she... he was yeah. celebrating, I guess like uh, the Olympiad medalists, right? If I'm not wrong. I don't know if I'll find it from essentially just uh googling right here but essentially he did definitely oh wait actually it's result number one look at that so like he literally said tanya saya ucapkan kepada pasukan olympiad fizik malaysia yang berjaya memenangi satu pingat perak dan dua gangsa di ipho yang berlangsung di tokyo japan i'll be interviewing Chong, by the way um also as part of uh, this series but i mean was this actually the first time, um, Ivan, like that maybe like a prime minister, a sitting prime minister has actually like celebrated something like this before? Uh, I don't know if like, that's actually the case. I don't maybe think I remember like, any such occasion. I don't remember any such occasion either. And that's what just makes me think that maybe there is an opportunity um, at some point, but somehow there's just a mismatch between, I guess like that expressed valuation of like you know like our young talents and also like what's actually being done on the ground like i hear from like the other olympiad medalists about how like you know things like chemistry olympiad also are beset by problems like this so i don't know it's been uh interesting to hear about that would you share um what you think was the most memorable moment for you as um the head coach of i guess like this team this yeah, team or remember. over the years? Well, it could be like this team or over the years. I don't know if they're going to be sad if like <laughs> if they're like, oh, <laughs> my, me- like your best memories were not with. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But yeah, like over the years, it could be. Well, I mean, uh, I might be a bit biased and uh, I kind of feel bad to say this, but like the the best moments was when I realized that our country did want the gold medal. Mm. Last year, this year as well. So, last year and this year as well. Oh, I see. So, uh... and last year we even had one bronze, one silver, and one gold. That is actually really good. All right. And yeah. This, like, and this year there are like three bronze medals, which is also really good. Mm. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um. I may be honest. The best moments are pretty much the moment when the result are out. Right. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think I do remember uh, this right here. Like There were like different articles right here about uh, the different things right here. But yeah, I mean, like that's understandable. And especially, like, when, I when think we won medals. Mm. Yeah. People only look at the highest medal. Uh, maybe I want to mention this. So Ming Heng and Wei Jie, mm. actually, they really wanted the medal mm. because last year they got the Haitian. Right, right. And mm-hmm. Time is running out for them. They don't have much chance because they are in uh, college already. 
So I kind of made the training this year in a way that maybe I did not say that, but like in a way that there are more easier questions so that it actually suits both of them going from HM to bronze. And uh, yeah, I'm actually quite glad that both of them did well. Like they actually finally got what they want. Mm, amazing. Okay. Uh, I know Kong Wing is a bit upset with the bronze, but uh, mm. put it in this way, let's try to aim for tricolored medals. I think that is impressive <laughs> to me. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think he had the HM and then silver and then bronze. So then bronze. if he has so like, got medal, more. medal next year, then he basically completed every possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Kong Wang. Uh, you go. He's uh, currently at IOI, if I'm not wrong, right? I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good luck. Uh, fight for our country. Well, I guess, would you share a little bit about like your unique coaching methods? Um, if you have any like uh, unique coaching methods for like the IMO team of Malaysia? And like, you feel that those have like changed over the Because like you've had like, quite a long experience in like coaching all together right so like i guess like has yeah. that approach changed in some way as well you must make sure that i mean you can't really make sure but you can only try your best to make uh to kind of educate them in a way that they are doing the math olympiads not just how should i put it not just for uni you know mm -hmm. to really get them to be interested in the problem solving the map itself instead uh, that's the very starting point instead of teaching them the usual tricks what I did was I really write down my internal thoughts and kind of treasure box of ideas back then when I was solving some of the questions like how did I solve them how did I think of the problem and then basically just compile them into like homeworks or uh, daily tasks or like reading materials for them to read as well. Okay, interesting. Wow. Huh. And it takes longer time to write those than writing handouts because handouts is just like a list of problems and then some example problems and then you write the solution. But to write up the thought process, the thought process. That's, the, that's the difficult part. So if you may think of it as unique, then sure. But I don't think it's that special. But uh, uh, yeah, really, when you want to coach a student well, and the way I look at it is I basically want to throw away every knowledge that I have to them mm -hmm. in the best way possible. Then what is the best way? You know, you, you can give them handouts, but I think the most direct way is to just tell them the thought process and the ideas and how you think of the problem. I think a good coach tells you how to think, not just how to solve. Yeah. That problem. Thinking the is the as to why like I was um thinking about this question in the first place is that as I understand it, math Olympiad is not something that you can necessarily like learn uh, from a teacher in the, sense, in the sense that the teacher essentially will like you know like teach you content for example like for the entire time right there like yeah. there surely is going to be or actually is this inevitable is it inevitable perhaps that you know someone would end up well going from like listening to math lectures into well um just doing math on their own uh along the course of their i guess like math olympiad journey like and yes I, uh, mm. so I, to answer that question i think indirectly answering that question uh here's also another unique way that i coached before it may sound kind of irresponsible but honestly i think it's a really Love good it. way okay go on is that i do not prepare the classes beforehand i do not prepare the classes everything is spontaneous I walk into the class, I take a problem, and then I solve it right in front of their eyes. There are chances that I could not solve it. That is fine. And I want them to know why this doesn't work. 
and why I'm stuck. Mm. That's good for them. They need to know that their teacher is not a superhuman. Perfect. I see. In, in fact, I told them, if you are going to always think that I can solve every problem, then you can't do better than me. You have to see there are times when I fail, realize what made me fail those problems, and then mm. think for yourself what are the better ways that you can solve. Absolutely. I think that's the key difference when mm. students want a teacher who teach them and spoon feed them knowledge, yeah, and yeah. those who are willing to take the risk but learn how the teacher is thinking and mm. then do better for the teacher. Yeah. It's not it's not the same as me preparing the classes and spontaneously solve the problems. I think solving the problems on the spot really gives them some insight on how to think of the problems. Whereas if you have packaged them in a way that you have taught them through and then just write out the solution, then people only work. learn they do not learn the process behind how you think of them. For example, I would even ask them questions like I'm stuck at this step. What do you think I can do? Mm. And then they will tell me suggestions. And then I will try the suggestions or I will tell them, I don't think this is going to work. Mm. If you don't believe me, let's try that. And then I will show them why this doesn't work. And then maybe sometimes I will suggest, I have this idea. Let's try this. And then we'll show it. So they really observe how I think of the problems, not just I solve it and then I see how I solve it. It's mm. really the thinking part that is important. I see. Okay. Then this is the I part where a very good teacher or so-called professional teachers may not do because they want to make it professional and make it really, how should I say, look nice. Presentation. Yes. Not for me. Everything is on the spot and raw. I see. It, it also saves my time as well. So I don't have to have headaches before the classes to prepare everything. You know, it saves my time and I think students learn more as well. Even during the times when I actually got stuck at the problem and wasted time, there are no wasted time in my opinion. Because even when I'm stuck, I still keep thinking of ideas. What do you think this could work? What do you think we should continue from here? Why are these ideas doesn't work? And then I even asked them, I tried it and it doesn't work. Do you really think this doesn't work or I have something else that I did not try? Sometimes they will actually tell me something that I did not notice and I tried it and it worked. It's not to say that they could solve it, but they kind of randomly think of the ideas. Mm. Maybe because they are still students that do not believe in themselves and they just think oh, it's just an idea. But when I do it for them, here's the part psychologically as well. They also increase their self-esteem because they know that what they lack is the fluency of math, but they have the ideas. That's the difference. So what I wanted them is to build the fluency in math. Then when they have the ideas, they can do it on their own. Fascinating. Mm. Whereas if you only spoon feed them knowledge, they will never gain this self-confidence that they can create ideas on their own as well it's very right different. and that's so important to education because at the end of the day you're not just well hearing facts right like knowledge yeah. is one of those things that you use it's like strength right like if you think about it like if you say that somebody is strong for example if you look at like for example how they have lifted weights for example you are only actually looking at the history of their having been strong and like you have an idea of like maybe what they can lift uh, perhaps but you never know like what will happen at a point when they actually try to lift a weight because like they may not be able to lift more than let's say I don't know like yeah. a kilogram two kilograms in a similar way I've always thought about knowledge that it's one of those things that doesn't really exist until the point of its exercise and it's interesting to um, hear you think of it in that way so like, I think that teachers could definitely learn uh, quite a fair bit from what you've uh, mentioned earlier as well. Like, also, I think that this is also a consistent theme that has gone through our conversation so far. This idea of like, 
you know, actually using, I guess, like, uh, like what's in your head or like developing that rather than just going after prestige, reputation or anything else uh, of that nature or things that, well, not prestige or reputation, that doesn't exactly apply here in this context, just more of like things, that, like, yeah, things that look good on the surface, but don't ultimately, well, translate into, shall we say, doing, okay. Um, all right then. Whereas for me, I'm going for the essence of the knowledge transfer itself. So it may not seem very polished because right. in fact, I would even go into the class and I ask the student, can you think of a random thing today? And maybe Pascal triangle. Then I would just start from the Pascal triangle and then let him try to deduce many facts from the Pascal triangle itself. Many things that he did not think of the properties but I pointed out to him. That's okay. the difference because he himself is interested in the object, but okay. looking at it, he doesn't know what to think or how to think of that object. I see, interesting. My task is not to point that out, oh, these are the facts of this thing. It's like, if you look at this item, what can you deduce or what can you infer from this structure? That's the part that I want him to think about and make observations from. In the end of the day, it's not me telling him what the Pascal triangle has or what's the properties of it, but it's telling him how you can find those properties. I see. Okay. It's That's probably not one of those things that you can do in like five minutes, right? Because otherwise I would ask you, oh, can you show me? No. <laughs> oh, well, definitely not. Definitely uh, not one of those things that you can do. Two hour classes for Pascal Triangle. Two hour? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, no worries. Okay. Really, the yeah, classes are spontaneous. But I think they really teach the students well how to think and not just learn. Not just learn. Learning is fine. I mean, you know, you can give them any books they can learn. But how to think, that's the, point, that that's the point that is really missing, I think. I see. And okay. that separates the best and the average students, I think. The best and the average students. Mm. Those who can really think and dare to try the ideas, those are the really good students. I see. Amazing. Okay. I guess... But not every single student at the outset would know like how to prepare for a math competition, right? So then like would you don't I guess like have any suggestions? Don't for... competitions. Sorry, what? Actually speaking professionally, I should give advice, but if you really, really ask me personally, don't prepare for math contests. Don't. Okay. In what sense? Treat them as just puzzles and solve for fun. Oh, okay, okay. I see. Treat them as and in fact, and in fact, um, it's the same as uni math or anything in general. Like math research. If you don't find it as a puzzle, just don't pursue it. I see. Um. It, so like, if what, what are you like distinguishing? The, like, I guess puzzle from here. So like, there's a puzzle, and then there's like something else, like a problem. What I mean is, or like it's competition. Kind of, it's not a problem. Uh, what I mean is. Uh, don't don't pursue them if you don't find them as puzzles or like interesting. Uh, preparing for math contest is not for the sake of preparing, but mm. you know you you don't need to prepare for it. You just maybe take the past years or like think of them as sources for interesting prompts. That's the that's the way you can think about it. Sources of interesting prompts. And then, if you want to, just register for yourself for the contest, but keep the mindset of always looking for puzzles to find, to, to solve. Would this also be the same advice that you would give to somebody who has, like, never seen a math contest before, or, like, has not been, I guess, like, introduced to this sort of, like, mathematical thinking before? I mean, like, would there not be, like, perhaps some degree of, like, knowledge that a person may need to obtain like in the very yeah first again if, you, if you're speaking from a more pro professional way then of course you have uh you need to start from this first read some books and then uh, then you can try it, these problems and then uh you need some of these books so that you can have this quite acquire this knowledge 
yes, of course, as I said, like professional advice, yes, there are a lot of things to say, to talk about. But really what I'm trying to point out is the motivation. We really don't practice to prepare for, uh, for contests. That's the key difference that I wanted to point out. Is it like a question because of many, like many your students, motivation in the sense of like, if you do not treat it like a series of puzzles that are interesting to solve, but rather you treat it as something... You treat the contest as if it's a reward. test of your ability. That's what I look at it. The contest is some test of your ability. If you have prepared yourself, I mean, not really prepared, but more like you're used to solving some interesting puzzles already, then, you know, some contests would just naturally be easy for you as well. Mm. I'm not saying that IMO has to be like that, but in the in some sense, really it is as well. Because when you're at a certain level, you don't really practice for the easy questions anymore. Mm. Like for example, Jared, he still does, but not often. I easy see. problems will be just like questions that you see them and you can solve it anyways. I have known some students really drew the questions just so that they can do well. And I find it quite sad to hear. From other countries, at least. They really do it so that they can write that in their CV for uni apps, for jobs. Mm. Or like, they, you know, they see it as a life-changing event that if they can get to the IMO, win the medal, you know, uh, there will be many companies who want Olympians like that because they are smart and so on. It's always the stigma and the fame, the prestige and the mm. recognition is interesting to them. Mm, I see. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not the right motivation in my opinion. I see. And I mean, okay. I guess maybe a question um, about Jaron. Like, do you feel that there is something that's special about the way that I guess like Malaysia's first double gold medalist like approaches math or like the way that he. He I guess, like, has a very has good. Uh, he has a very good fluency in terms of math. I can agree with that. Mm. His fluency in math, where he can express what he's thinking in terms of math, is excellent. I think that separates him from many other students. Uh, what I think is special is that. No, sorry. This fluency is special already, but there is one more quality that is very different from others. Is that he can really break down a big problem into small parts to solve. Mm. Really work through each small parts patiently, step by step, until he reached the final goal. I think many students are thinking in terms of scattered ideas. Oh, this idea works, and then you got to this step, and then try other steps, and then solve this. Oh, and then you get it. That's all. What you really want is someone who is patient enough. Even if the problem requires many steps to solve it, you will still solve each subtask bit by bit until you reach the final goal. So sometimes you will read his solutions having like 10 pages. It's common. Wow. I do not think many students have that quality. Not even the IMO team members. Very few can do that. I personally can't, I can say. Wow. Okay. All right. Shout out Jaron so, to our hashtag special. <laughs> I don't feel like he's doing it by throwing random ideas in and then hope for one to work. He's really kind of deducing step by step from here. What is a possible uh, next claim or lemma that I can follow from here and then do it patiently just like that. So his way of solving is kind of linear progression and not like throwing ideas and hope that one, one would work and so on. Yes, like a solve. So reading his solution time. feels very, reading his solution feels very smooth to read it, you know. Whereas for some others, it would be like, how did you come up with this? I see. Yeah. Okay, understood, understood. Okay. Then kind of moving, um, I guess, to a question of like, from that goal uh, medal part right there, if you were to ask like, say a beginner student to read about like basic types of materials right there, like would you have any recommendations for like books to begin, I guess like that journey or like avenues for? I would say 
some of the recommended books in Imon's website. Mm. I think some uh, uh, there's a book called uh, Out of Problem Solving by Paul Zegs. And there are also four books from Mr. Swami as well. He wrote it himself. Uh, those are definitely worth reading. Mm. I see. Okay. Uh, I do not have this plan yet, but maybe one day I might write my own book. But I'm not sure yet. I know Tristan definitely wrote his book. It's definitely not during when I'm studying, but I yeah, see. maybe. Sure. Then I guess like moving towards, I guess like uh, the end, uh, but just before. So how do you foster, I guess, like teamwork and collaboration amongst like the team members, especially like in a field where, you know, like it, you have to essentially like sit down and solve the problems for like often hours on end, right? So that it's not like a situation where you can like just have a communication, that sort of thing right there. So like, how do you do that, I guess? Yeah, exactly. This is why don't do comp competition math too much. Because <gasps> math yeah. research is called sometimes. It's not just like sitting on your desk hours only. Uh, you will need mathematical communication sometimes. You will need communication you know, for sure. Like Got it. Sometimes you're stuck at this point, but some of your friends might know how to progress from there. Mm. But after that, they might be stuck and again, and you can complete it for them. So there can be collaborative elements in math as well. It's not mm. like competition where you have to do it by yourself alone. I see. Okay. Um, how do I try to force it? Well, it's not something a trainer can do really, but naturally the students having the same interests, they will just talk about themselves. I'm surprised by myself as well because when I first met the students in a huge group, mm. first time uh, this year, because they are taking the APMO, for the first time they are doing it offline, so with venue, in the venue, Mm. I've never seen any of these students in person before, except maybe Jaren or Minghun. The rest, I've never seen them in real life before. Wow. Mm. And them among themselves also have never seen each other in real life because the camps has been online. But then when I saw them, they are just discussing math among themselves or even chit-chatting, having, talking. Wow. Other things. Uh -huh. Where, where did that come from? They have never seen each other you know, before. So then, I mean... So it is not something that I can reinforce, but naturally, and I'm very glad to see that just happens by themselves. Amazing, yeah. And it really be nice to show that that not, so it's not so isolating as people would think it is. Mm, amazing. Okay. So I think that this is a good point to transition towards the final part of uh, our interview. Uh, so thank you for your time, uh, Taspa. Uh, no problem. No problem. And if you could share, so like, what are your hopes, right, for the future of mathematical education, like within this country? Of course, like, you know, in your case right here, you are performing a rarefied kind of coaching. It is for a very select group of people who are, well, learning math at an extremely high level. Of course, you know, like it, it targets a specific type of math. Um, this I will concede. It will not target every single type of math right here. But I guess, do you have like some specific hopes for, I guess, like mathematical education and its evolution like within this country? Okay. So I feel like we are basically three or four years behind many other countries. Because I see yeah. many other countries. Um, would you, I guess, like... Uh, maybe not many others, but like, say, Singapore or China, I would say. Mm. I mean, the, in China, I remember they are doing algebra in, like, fourth grade, I think. Fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Got you. So yeah. definitely, we, are, we, we could do much better, even from the beginning. Like, I guess in terms of, like, not focusing on differences that don't necessarily matter right here. I mean, like, I guess, like, the way that maybe the Malaysian education system, at least historically, um, has, 
I guess operationalize like that increase in difficulties by like digits that kind of thing right yeah. but by yeah. digits but I mean so you're calling for something that's a bit more I guess like sophisticated than that so like I guess like is there also I guess like a difference in not just like digits but also a content but like a way of like teaching essentially ah okay I mean, you really want teachers who are passionate in the subject, not right. only teaching. Yeah. Right. That will be not easy really as well, because, like, I'm sure that, like, even... Because, like, even the concern with, you know, like, administering an English language curriculum is that maybe you don't have enough teachers to actually do that. In a similar way, I guess, maybe the difficulty might be training up a generation of math teachers who are able to actually teach in a way that, you know... Um, pushes us to yeah, but, Singapore or China. Yeah, but I think that the, the, the really crucial thing is that we really need teachers who are passionate in the subject. It's not just math, like any teacher. We, we do not want teachers who teach just for a living, but mm. really, and not just because they like teaching students, but also because they, are, they like the subject itself. Mm. Because speaking from experience, many teachers they do not like students who challenge their ideas or mm. challenge text, for example. Mm. I've right. asked questions in school where it is outside the textbook, for example, and it did not went well. Let me put it this way. I see. So, so the teacher literally just says like, okay. I, uh, I, I don't really want to comment about what happened, but... Uh, uh, yeah, sorry for asking about... Uh, but like, mm. No, it's fine. I don't, I just don't want to criticize my teacher, you know. I see. Okay, understood. Yeah. And, but it really comes to show that we need teachers who are interested in the subject and that they are allowing students to explore the subject if they are really into it and agree. most students in the school most of them they are just wired to excel in grades and they don't really have a specific interest but we need teachers who are able to cultivate their interests and mm. really kind of help the student to shine if they have talent in it mm. especially something like math if not because of my math teacher who agreed to help me to register for MK, for example, I would not be in DPI mode at all. Mm. I had a very good math teacher, an MS teacher, in fact. And she took the time to learn some Olympiad math by herself because we all did. You know, you can really feel the passion of the teacher herself. Mm. That wow. is different. Mm. Absolutely. And that, that's why the subjects, the curriculum has to be interesting. Otherwise, it would be very routine work to just teach the same thing every single year. And, yeah, because like, you, you know, wouldn't be struggling. And then unfortunately, it's well. kind of beyond what the... It's unfortunately beyond the, 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 the teacher's uh, range of power that they can dictate what kind of things they want to teach. So it just happens. But at least what we can do is the syllabus to make it more interesting. That you know, you're not teaching, just adding digits, digits from yeah. ten to a hundred. <laughs> I mean, I'm not an educator, so just please take my words with a grain of salt. Grain of salt. I see myself more as a mathematician instead. I hope. Well, that's uh, perfect so, because my next question then is, can you share your thoughts on the potential for math at large? Well, like both in academia, practical applications. And I'm sure that like perhaps your interests like they evolve along some line right there. I don't know whether it's necessarily related to anything like real world, but I guess yeah, if you have any thoughts on like the potential of mathematics at large, if you think of any um interesting applications that you can see it coming to or yeah. Do 
eventually all branches of mathematics are going to merge, I think. If you look what? at Lang Lang's program, the Lang Lang's program, for example, that is a huge effort and attempt to merge all fields of mathematics, basically trying to describe these different fields in a more general way. Maybe let me write it down in the chat. Langlands program. Langlands. Ah, okay, okay, got it. Uh, yeah. All right, okay. So that is just within math itself. You can see the unification already, and it's the same for physics as well. Many people have been trying to unify like quantum physics and general relativity. Same goes to knowledge, I think, because as you can see that even the notion of computing itself. All of us kept thinking it's just zero and one and it's about trying to output stuff given an input i or mean that was an innovation that was test. introduced by claude shannon was it not i mean like the whole idea of zeros and yes ones, so then yes i mean and even that this even, even this idea is going to be challenged as well with quantum computing you know there's a new way to look at computing as a physical process that it is really just, uh, as I said, physical processes where you are taking, computing something or observing something is just making a measurement of the physical process. That's the essence of quantum computing. Whenever you have a qubit, you measure it, then it falls to one of the possible states according to a probability distribution. And that itself is basically a huge revolutionary idea that computing things is not so different than a physical process that is physics. And then you also have biology where people are starting to investigate into what is consciousness and what makes AI so special. Why can't AI artificial intelligence and biological systems merge. And then you really raise the question, what is consciousness? You know, all these are suggesting that our field of studies, biology, chemistry, physics, computing, computer science, math, all of these, or even material science, all of these are going to merge eventually. And I see that as natural because so far we are just scattered around in different areas but what are they for mm. so in my opinion this is the trend that i'm seeing right now and it's good for me because i like to see connection between fields i do not like to be competitive and just delve into one field mm. it's kind of boring to just do the same thing for many years and this comes to the last question of this interview um right here so like what kinds of i guess like personal goals or projects are you looking forward to in light of this world of math that is becoming more interconnected or maybe like on your part like you are more i guess like interested in you know particular development of math but yeah so like what sorts of personal goals do you have um that i guess like align with this strange world of math that you're undertaking at the moment I guess like the most intuitive thing to consider would be like your master's thesis, but maybe you're looking like beyond that as well. Yeah, I think after my master's thesis, I realized I still like discrete math more. After Relative all, to... It's like, I don't mind learning algebra, geometry, topology, or like stuff like that. I don't mind. In fact, I do like them. It's just that maybe not so much to just do them in fact, I, may, I might see them more as tools to solve more concrete problems, I think. Because, mm. you know, some topological problems can be very, very abstract. I see. And I realized after my thesis that... What is your thesis about? My, well, it's on analytical number theory. Okay. okay. I, I think I'm more inclined towards this good map after all. It's... So, sort of similar to the math that I was doing in Olympias. Mm. Yeah. And algorithms, 
also interests me. Something new that I only took up after I came to Bonn. I like mm -hmm. algorithms. Uh, so, US has been in my watch list of PhD programs. The US mm -hmm. is my watch list because of that. Uh, I also like theoretical physics um, from Cambridge back then. Uh, the quantum physics classes completely changed my life because I did not know that's how you can think of the world. Uh, and also quantum computing as well. That is like, interesting. Like about quantum physics uh, and quantum computing, these two are life changing classes for me. Okay. The very uh, first statement about quantum computing that computing things are really just physical processes and you take the observations of it. That is a profound statement. I think that is a very profound statement to me. Uh, yeah, AI, I'm not so much of a fan to it, but I suppose a very obvious way to improve on it is to first build a quantum computer and then see how you can merge these two things for quantum AI to happen. Because if you think about it, the processes in our brain are so small, and eventually, if you want to shrink it even further in size, you can't neglect the quantum effects. Eventually, uh, quantum AI has to be a thing. Eventually. I see. Interesting. So, like, I guess, like, just kind of, like, running from there and, like, knowing limited amounts of what you're saying right here from that statement. Um, so, if it's a physical process and you're taking observations of it, then basically, then um, it would mean that perhaps if you become better at taking observations of it, then uh, that would be the secret perhaps to like improving, I guess, like uh, the physical manifestation of like what we operationalize as essentially the metrics of like computing power, like to a higher level. Well, maybe it, or maybe more philosophically, what makes us a computer then? Mm, what makes us that goes back to that go, goes back to not just physics not com just computing maybe biology and even philosophy as well what, what makes us a computer well, then? well what are like, the sort of observations um, of some measurements people, that like people who think about psychology might think about um psychology from a few different perspectives right like one of which is like, I guess, like, the cognitive model, like, a uh, computational model in which you treat the brain as a computer, but I don't know if, like, we can assume that the brain is necessarily... Yeah, exactly. Like it, it's not a rigorous argument, I would say, that you assume that a brain is a computer. I think that is the biggest problem that we I want to understand. That. Why can a brain be a computer, then? What does it really mean to compute something? I'm, I'm, I'm not, is it I'm that not sure oh, if you pass a Turing machine or you pass a Turing test, then you are a computer? You can say so, but why is that? Why? Must it be zero and ones using bits as Shannon has proposed? Mm. It need not be as quantum computing has shown. So really, you know, all these knowledge that we have, this they are trying to answer something quite common in you about us humans ourselves because after all in the end these knowledge are created by humans if we are good we are to see some other aliens they may have a completely different set of knowledge mm -hmm. and it's um interesting as well yeah at the end of the day i think that's what's going to happen about uh, with the academy or at least the direction i hope to see that we will the direction that I never want to see is to let AI be so powerful that they answer these questions for us because they won't. They just won't. The AI will not answer these questions for us. Okay, cool. Um I guess the, the final final question for you is like, do you have anything that you would like to share or like any like particular thoughts as well? Persevere. 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 Thank you so much. And work hard. Uh, and, work hard. and that's true for like basically everyone. Thank you so much, Ivan. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having